welcome everyone out tonight. And uh, this is our first budget workshop of 2024. And again, it's a workshop. You know, action's going to be taken. But a lot of debate can take place. Uh, fight for what you believe in to get the money that you need. And let's go at it. I'll turn it over to Mr. Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Christian. As you know, um, we are going to start uh, the agenda with some good news this evening, talk a little bit about TISA, where we're at as a school system, uh, any costs or expenditures that we're looking at uh, that we may know about now as we go into the budget season for next year. Uh, but as you said, no action tonight, just to give an idea of where we're at, what we need to prioritize as far as needs uh, going into next year, and then hear from the board uh, regarding any uh, any things that you, you would like us to consider or be interested in looking at, uh, we, we would take those requests this evening as well. Uh, with that being said, I would like to turn it over to uh, Melissa, uh, who's going to lead us off with our 2022-23 uh, audit and fund balance as it stands now, because we do have the actuals coming back in for uh, that school year. So attached to your agenda there, you'll see a couple of documents. Um, well, first let's talk about the audit. Um, you all should have, should have gotten the notice in December when the audit was released. I think we discussed that already. So um, now that, that everything's completed with 2223, we normally do this, what we refer to as fund balance resolution. And that's the second page behind your agenda. Um, right now, I don't know exactly what date that we'll be taking that before County Commission because we, all, we always do that um, when the local government has their resolution ready to. So I'm not sure if that'll go in March, well, February or March, probably so. Um, but as you can see down there, when you, the center of the page, it shows you what we have estimated the fund balances to be for 22-23 in the 23-24 budget document. So you can see how um, the difference is there and, and what those come to. So um, then if you look at the second page that's attached there, that's that um, general purpose fund five-year history. I always like to have you all so that you can kind of look and see um, how the, the years have played out. Along with the fund balance resolution, um, one thing that you will notice, the very first thing on that general purpose bulletin history report for 22-23, under fund balance, we have had projected using like 4.8 million in fund balance to balance the budget. We actually didn't use any fund balance when all of the final expenditures were done. We actually added back 244000 to fund balance. So when you look at fund balance resolution, that's where you see the change in the 912000 as far as the difference of the fund balance versus what we had estimated it to be. Um, that also shows you in 2223, what our um, BEP estimate was versus the 2324 TSA. And then the local option sales tax, total revenues, and total expenditures. So I'll let y'all look at that for a second and see if you have any questions on any of those two documents. Historical look back document 
is that in 1819 there was a 3.5 cent decrease uh, by the county commission to educational funding and then also a two cent in 1920. That amount came off of that 12 cent increase that Mr. Starnes had uh, fought for prior to me coming. So considering that that was reduced, that amount of money, we've taken on a number of projects through the help of ESI and ESSER over the last three years and uh, taken off a lot of those big expenditure projects such as HVAC at the two high schools, um, some tech purchases and some temporary staffing to assist in academic gain. I think that the, the fact that we were able to realize a positive movement on our fund balance in 22-23 is pretty amazing. Now, what I would couple that with is unfortunately when you see a, a five and a half cent decrease over a two year span uh, going back to 1819 and 1920, that affects our ability to utilize fund balance as a savings for accomplishing big ticket items such as upcoming roofing projects at both high schools to the tune of seven or eight million dollars. If we would have had that funding in place over the last four years, we'd be in a much better position to not have to go to our taxpayers for a potential bond uh, in those cases. So while we're doing the best we can with the budget we have, it would have been nice to have that savings building up over the last four years to tackle some of those problems. I wonder what five and a half cents, if we would have kept that over the years, what would that equate to? Melissa, can you do that in your head? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, for some any students, over the years um, in the in 22 or 23-24 budget um, one cent at the 93 percent collection rate is $119,000. $119,000. So we're well, talking over that. You know, it, like I said, it, it's gone up a little bit over the years. A few years ago it was closer to like a little under $100,000. But roughly, I, I guess you could average it out probably around the $100,000 over the last five years. Okay. Let's be a chunk of money taken from that. <laughs> but I understand the wages that we need in within our county, but it does I just have to say this, this being the first budget workshop and I've sat on this board for a lot of years and been in a lot worse situations than we are now. So I want to thank you all, you and your staff and Mr. Dixon for uh, the money management that we're seeing today to be able to put money like this back into the fund balance. And if I'm understanding correctly, when we approved this current budget, or last year's budget, this year, the budget we're in now, that it was going to take $4 million to balance the budget. Is that correct? The 23-24, we projected, I think, uh, 2.3, yeah. 2.3 million to balance. And we put that back plus two hundred forty-four thousand. A year prior. So Sorry, we're realizing the twenty-two, twenty-three actuals now. That's so we're a year behind. Yes. But this year we projected taking less than we had the previous year, so I think we're still going to wind up in a very good position when we see the actuals this time next year for twenty-three, twenty-four. Okay. Right. That makes sure sense. That we're always looking back that year. Everybody understands. So I'm saying a lot of a very well money management taking place, even with the loss that we've, that we've had to take. When you consider we projected taking almost $5 million from 4.8 from uh, projected fund balance withdrawal to budget our, to, to balance our budget, and we're putting back, so we've completely swung that and put it back to $44,000, that's yeah. a big swing. Yeah, but what, what I need folks to understand, and Jeff, you can help get the message out that it's, it's very difficult for us as a school system to take care of our maintenance issues. Very difficult. I think Mr. Hickson touched on that. Uh, even though we are managing the money that the best that we can, locally it's hard for a county to do what they would really like to do. Our county commission does what they can with what they have to work with. 
and with the maintenance issues that we do have upcoming, these roofs are going to be very expensive, very expensive, but they have to be done. Because some people say that public education may be going away. I'm not banking on that at all. We have to have public education. And we have to have a place for these children to be educated in. And unfortunately, the savings that we are seeing is going right back into our schools. I'd like to find a better revenue source for that, stretch out, get a loan, do something, get bonds. But unfortunately, the county situation being what it is, currently, we can't get bonds. So we have to get into our reserve fund. And we have to be diligent how we spend our money for it's fair and equitable for everyone in our system. I just hope everyone understands that. It's not easy managing this kind of money with the responsibilities that we have. Now, I just wanted to say that and, and get it up record. I think we're doing a fine job managing the money and making plans for the future. That's all I got on that. So, if y'all have any questions about the uh, fund balance resolution or the general purpose fund history, next thing we want to just kind of update a little bit on TISA. Um, there are, uh, we, we receive what they what the state calls uh, bonus payments through TISA or another term for shoring up or, or taking into account what we're uh, what our services are for unique learning needs students if you remember there's 10 criteria under TISA that generate additional funds for caring for students with uh, needs coming to the county school system there's also uh, monies tied toward generating additional students heading into CTE and a variety of different programs within our career technical education we received our first payment, our first bonus payment uh, last month, and uh, we are receiving another one in March. And we are estimating that we're probably in the year with close to 700,000 coming additional above and beyond what we um, budgeted coming in. And that is due to the diligence of the supervisors that are sitting here in the audience this evening in making sure that we are documenting all students and their needs correctly and making sure that we're responding to those needs appropriately with the appropriate staff and accommodations and interventions, as well as on the CTE side, making sure that we have additional opportunities for those students to make every use of our relationships with local businesses, industry, uh, for work-based learning opportunities, internships, and opportunities in and out of the school. So I'm very, very happy to uh, let you know that we have received that. We're getting another payment in March, and that's looking very, very good as well. We are continuing to wrap our head around TISA. I think Rodney uh, is, is uh, about got nuts trying to keep up with all the data. Uh, as you know, we talked about last year when, the, when TISA was rolling out. We've got to report every single student and have them correctly identified and categorized every month. And that's what generates our next year's month-to-month -month funding. And that's what also factors into these bonus payments and uh, receipts that we're receiving now. But so far, so good. So the next thing is the uh, property tax ratio and maintenance of that for course. Um, since we're having to back up and do things earlier, I um, have no idea what the property tax um, will be. I, I don't anticipate the county will raise the property tax any. I, I anticipate it probably will stay um, pretty close to the same as where we're at, at now. And um, it looks like we're kind of staying on track with our enrollment um, as far as our average family memberships, um, you know, that, that affects the um, TISA and also, you know, maintenance of effort. So, um, looks like we're kind of pretty level there with, with that figure. Um, the next thing was the TCRS rates. Uh, 
currently the legacy teacher rate is 6.81 percent. I found out today, actually, and I'd already had the um, agendas printed, but I, I got my uh, local finance update that we get emailed each month from TDOE, and it actually had the legacy teacher rate for the next fiscal year for 24-25. And that's going to decrease from 6.81% to 6.36%. So I was glad when I saw that number. Um, as you know, we're going to have to face the um, increase in the, the teacher's salary to uh, continue that that five-year increase to like you know you know to where it is in law that we've got to increase it. So this is going to hopefully help offset that a little bit because we're going to save a little bit on the TCRS side. Um, the non-certificated rate, it's currently 6.02%. As you all know, we have to do that or that same rate as what the local government does. And for the last few years, they have, have insisted on contributing 7%. Um, so I kind of anticipate that's probably where that will stay again this year. Um, since we have been putting extra in there the last few years, even once TCRS's actuarial studies are done, that should help us as far as we shouldn't be hit with a big increase. That should help kind of keep that percentage down. And then, of course, the hybrid rate stays at that 9%. Any questions about TCRS? Um, with the medical uh, insurance, you know, I think maybe one year, I'll be here 10 years at the end of next fiscal year from when I moved up from the mayor's office. And I want to think maybe one year out of the time I've been here, we did not have a, a health insurance increase. So that's it's pretty much something we can count on, on every year. Of course, the rates just now increased this past January. so. Usually it's May before we even have any idea of what the insurance rates are going to look like. Um, so we'll do our best to, you know, estimate that in the budget based off of the current rates. If we don't, if we don't have any idea of what they will increase, um, we may just have to wait and increase it next January whenever we, we find out what the, the true amount's going to be. Um, has it been decent and consistent, or is it all over the map? And it's kind of all over the map. For for several years there, as far as when they would do an increase, it would kind of be an in, the same increase across the board. Mm -hmm. You know, we have we have four tiers. We have the employee only, uh, employee plus spouse, employee plus children, or employee plus children or child and family. So, what the states been doing now is kind of looking at which which tier is producing the most claims and you'll see the last two years employee spouses got hit worse than any other, than the other two tiers so that's kind of how they're, the, they're looking at it now and, and increasing those rates so you know employee employee only people may get a small increase of you know, 4%, 10%, then you may see employee spouse get a 5% increase. So it's kind of been, been all over the board the last couple of years, instead of it being the same across the board. So. Um, the next thing we wanted to talk about was um, staffing and um, SR 3.0, as y'all know, SR 3.0 is finishing up this year. Um, we're going to uh, have got everything done that we could possibly have done by June 30th. And we also know that we had several positions um, that we were paying for out of those ESSER funds. So we'll kind of let Matt talk about that. And so we, we've, we've uh, we contracted all of those individuals that were staffed through and paid for through ESSER funds, knowing that those funds were run out at some point. They're, they're one-time funds, but in, in reality, they lasted over uh, almost the span of, of close to uh, three full school years. So if you think about uh, the work that these folks have done, 
the good news is we feel like through attrition, most of those folks will be offered a, a position within the county because, as, as you all know, uh, about two weeks ago, we passed our 100th hire for certificated staff, just those that are uh, certified to teach within Hopkins County. We had over 100 officially a couple weeks ago. It's one of the most that we've ever uh, had to recruit for, unfortunately. Uh, so that is our reality. So these folks will have likely a position offered if they choose to want to stay within Hawkins County. Of those positions that we have identified a need to ultimately keep and move forward with, they're going to be really heavily weighted toward academic support and improvement um, and funding through TISA. So identifying and, and protecting our numbers, our data coming out, um, for example, I will recommend that we keep the additional FTE or, or full-time equivalent that we hired in attendance because that's a critical position in, in making sure our students are coded right, all our new enrollees are coded right, our ongoing students are coded correctly if they move from one academic track to another or within CTE or enter a CTE course or work-based learning opportunity or internship. We need to make sure those are all coded correctly along with unique learning needs and everything else that uh, that helps us with funding as well. So I will have those for you, those recommendations in the first draft that we bring back, uh, but please know they're around academic support and protection of our, C of, of our uh, TISA data. And we're looking at about three positions of the of the total, I think, um, I don't know what our total was. Do you remember as your position is total? I, I wanted to say 12 or 13, but don't quote me. I'll get you the exact number. Yeah, I think it was. Okay. And, and you're, you're saying you need three positions? We're recommending working in three positions into our general fund budget that we'll present to you in the first draft. And again, those are to keep our academic improvement uh, moving forward and protect the student data piece that we're looking that we're shopping. So these would be school personnel or central office staff? There'd be one, there'd be two, uh, as we have it now, there'd be two central office that are dedicated to academic improvement and data tracking and working with principals and staff, and then also in one in Rodney's office. Okay. The other one would be, uh, the other position would be uh, site based. And these aren't certificated people? Uh, one, one is, that the, the, well, I'll just tell you, our data integration supervisor, Laura Lee, is the position that's going to be at the central office who's certificated, and she would be the one that's continuing our efforts and tracking the data, working with our principals and helping okay. set those goals. So the other person, the other uh, personnel would be uh, class level. Okay. On that data tracking and coding for TISA, is it, uh, it's monthly, right? So is it, uh, is it like one shot or are they lenient on corrections or what's the? This year they've been fairly flexible. We're, we're working with how many data uh, pulls. We got our system, our Skyward system that collects our student data and then we upload to another system and then that ultimately talks to the state uh, EIS system. So at any given point, if they notice or we notice an error that needs to be fixed, they have been pretty workable and fixing that even after the deadlines. Now, I don't know if that's going to continue past this first year, right? but we've been able to, uh, with this estimated 700,000 by the end of this year, we've been able to correct a lot and make sure that we're getting recognized for what we're doing uh, student-wise. Okay. Yeah, good question. We, I don't know how it's going to look next year, but this year, from what Rodney has, has said, it's, it's it's been fairly flexible. I know that initially at the start of this year, we had a new tracking system for special needs students. And that was a nightmare to learn and implement and to talk with our systems and make sure they were compatible and make sure that they were going up and match what we were identifying. So as even within our tracking our student population, you could then refine that down to individual students and have what ifs occurring all along the way, which makes it difficult. Yeah. 
I would, I would be a full fan, and I think staff would echo this, if the state were to just say, here's the system you're going to use, you only have to upload it once, and it's there, and it matches what the state's pulling on a monthly basis as well. But that's unfortunately not where we're at yet. Right. One of the other things coming out of ESSER, um, as you all know, I think we, we um, made this change several years ago, uh, and that was to farm out uh, management of our substitutes. The company that does that is ESS, um, and they are, have been very, very good to work with. Um, our substitutes are afforded benefits for the first time. They're able to work five days a week, whereas we were capping them at four because of the benefits piece, we couldn't get them over 30 hours, so it capped what they could do uh, work a week. Um, so those benefits alone, as well as the savings that, of time and effort on the on the half of personnel, payroll, uh, benefits, uh, has been huge for us. We just met with them and talked about some ways to um, make sure that we understand the, the budgetary process a little better and, and uh, continuing those services. We've got some creative and interesting ideas to work with our school sites <coughs> regarding the requesting of subs and the amount of subs that we do need and, and need to get into our buildings. But uh, it would be recommended that we continue forward with ESS as part of this year's budget to move forward. And that comes out of ESSER and would be a, a budgetary item we would need to move over to general fund. Now, there are some uh, SPED uh, provided subs. There are also some federal provided subs, just depending on what those subs are doing and how they're filling needs at our school sites, what those employees that they're assigned to uh, fill, uh, what their duties are, and how they're funded as well. Does ESS charge like a flat, or is it per? Do they a, do a mix? Of, it's a flat overall fee of what we're, what we're paying for. Yeah, right. So they ask us for our daily rate, so if we increase that, we have to work with them to make sure that's increased. If, and they pay our employees just as if they were working with us. Uh, the same daily rate, we publish the scale every year, and then they match that, and then they take the, the percentage on top of that is what we do, what we can do. We have a dedicated on uh, in-district person. She actually grew up in Sequoinville and she's been a huge asset to work with Teresa and others uh, at the school site in filling those needs. Our sub-fill rates are about the same as when we managed our own, but they've got a much bigger pool to pull from now, which is helping get those rates down now that they've been established and they're building relationships with those substitutes, so that's been a good thing. So since we've had you kind of back up and, and meet earlier, you know, one of them, you know, we really don't have a whole lot of information. We don't have a whole lot of numbers to work with yet. Um, so Jennifer and I will be getting together uh, over the, the next several weeks and start you know, putting the actual budget document together. So That's when the uh, steam starts rolling out of the office. <laughs> Is there any specific items that that you all want included in the 2425 budget. Um, oh gosh. <laughs> Get ready. Okay, make a suggestion. Um, so we know that we're going to have to increase the salary of the teachers according to the state requirements. And I think uh, usually when you increase one group, as we talked before, um, the other groups kind of should be increased also. So I would like to see some incremental increases for the lower paid employees, like the teacher aides, or um, just think, I mean, you, you know the groups of employees that are, how they're separated. And maybe if we could think about uh, doing incremental increases for those groups, instead of having to then taking it out for inflation and then kind of like sporadically have to increase a lot at a time. I think it would work better if we increase a little bit at a time, but every year it would give them some kind of increase. I think that would help the people more and it would help 
us more to budget it. So if we could do that, that would work better. One, one thing when we revamped our salary scales um, a few years ago, so what we tried to do was um, one, you know, kind of get everybody closer um, to surrounding areas um, than what we were. And two, to try to build in some sort of an actual increase from step to step because, you know, we, we go from step zero to 30 on our scales. Um, and, and the reason we chose 30 is because you can retire after 30 years of TCRS. <laughs> and, well, that was with the old legacy rate. The hybrid plan now I think it's 35 years. But if you recall, our, our old scales had some steps on them that might jump five years with no increase. And you might have a $50 increase from one year to the next, which was, I mean, way up here in the 20, 20 years, which is nothing, you know. So what we tried to do was when we started with that base amount, there's um, increases between every step. So as somebody increases their step, they can count on getting that percentage of an increase. Um, and each step is equivalent to a year of service. Right. So, you know, we're, we're hoping that that's better than what it was because it's, it, does, it is a little bit better amount than what was on the other ones. So we can take a look and see what we, how that would work with the scales and maybe, like you're saying, incrementally increase those bases. And then, of course, that see what kind changes. of rolls up. But, uh, you know, let's but, just pour an arbitrary number. Let's say if we gave a 2% increase or a 1.5% increase. And see what that's going to cost us. Does that sound fair? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Even though it's not going to catch up with inflation at all, but well, that's not going to happen for anyone. So. Right. So, right. so, and that's a good point. I think what, what we work in, I think the lowest amount that we worked in our step when we, when we took the scales that may have ended at 15 years or 20 years and we increased all of them to 30 and then we took each year step. We tried to give a one, one and a half to two percent across all of those steps. So if you're a, a current employee and you continue with us, that two percent is work big. And then if we did something extra, so using that example, if they were getting a two percent per step increase from year to year, and then we gave them one and a half, that'd be the equivalent of a three and a half over year to date salary. So that's where we need to be cognizant and, and realize that. We did quite a bit. It, it's never enough. We're not caught up, but we're in a much better shape than we were several years ago just by making consistent tweaks across all the salary skills. But I hear what you're saying. We can definitely look at that. And, and more consistently, I, I've had Courtney working on pulling, you know, surrounding counties information um, so that we can, can know where everybody's at and try our best to stay as close as we can to them. But, but sometimes it's hard to compare apples to apples because there's where our scale is based on instructional assistance, for example, um, working 195 days um, and then they work seven hours a day. Another county, they may only work six and a half hours. And so they're getting, they could be getting paid a higher hourly rate, but they're working less hours than what we're working. Um, and what, what I've seen also is they're not offering that zero to 30. We're, we're actually higher than most of them when you get up in our higher steps on the scale. They're starting out higher than, you know, down here at the bottom maybe than what we are, but then they may, um, there's one, there's one system that it has $69 between every step all the way up to step 20. And then when you and then there's when it goes 21 plus, they get maybe a $900 jump. But up to that, $69 a year is all the increase they're going to get. And we have a much better increase built in to ours, you know, each year. So it, it's it's hard to to try to compare when we can't compare apples to apples. So, but we but we are definitely keeping on top of you know. 
to see where we're at compared to other systems. And the board did ask us to, to make sure that those salary surveys were kept current. So we're, we're working on, if, if you remember last year when we started to pull for one particular group, um, many of the systems were in the process of adopting and implementing their budget at the time. So we're making sure that what we have on the survey is accurate and, and current for this year. Since we've put that into place, are we seeing less get uh, picked by uh, other systems? You know, it's interesting. We're starting to see, a, a, I hope, a trend that continues, and that is that we're able to pull from others for the first time in history. And I think that that's, especially in the administrative positions, we've got some really good folks uh, through our interview process and recruiting process. Teresa is being commended for that. I, I think, uh, I think. What we're doing in Hawkins County is speaking for itself. Uh, you know my thoughts on the letter grades. I think that that has the potential to sidetrack us a little bit because I think we're making gains across the board. But I really think that how we treat our employees, how we treat one another, how we care for our students is speaking highly of the county. And we're actually able to recruit, hopefully, for the first time in history from those around us. Uh, we still do lose folks to answer your question. Um, Teresa does a good job of tracking that. Uh, when somebody resigns, we find out where it's to and, and what's being offered, that type of thing, as much information as we can gather so that we can continually improve. But we are seeing a shift potentially in that time. Okay, I have another question not connected to this. It's okay. Um, so I've heard about um, some comparison between substitutes, like teachers and substitute nurses. Do the nurses make less or more? Or somebody who does the information about that. Becky, did you hear that? Yes, the substitute teachers are paid, um, the substitute nurses, excuse me, are paid, I believe, on the teacher scale. Is that correct, Nancy? Um, we, we got a right for the substitutes. Yes, it is higher than a What's a nurse make? Say, Melissa has the salary scales. I don't have I'll try to pull it. Right it depends on, you know, so with the health services field, you have um, that one okay. end, you have the two year RNs, you have four year RNs, and then you should have a set of scale on the bottom of that. Yes. Look at your increases. I believe it's $82. Mine, I believe it is higher than the substitute. We do not use uh, contract nurses on our personal and human orientation period. We would monitor nurses and other sources of information. So the health services scale, we've got nurse LPN, nurse RN, and nurse RN with four year degrees, and then at the bottom of that scale. While they're looking at that, are we fully staffed with nurses? Yes, sir. So the eighty, the uh, substitute nurses, certified substitute nurse rate is eighty dollars a day. That's a nurse. Correct. That's a. Did you say substitute? Yes. It's substitute yes, nurse, substitute. and no, so substitute teachers. we look at teachers. It won't be on there because they're ESAs. Um, so a full day substitute teacher, of course, it, 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 they're again, it depends. If it's a certified teacher, it's $80 a day also. But if it's a non-certified teacher, it's $70 a day. Okay. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Becky. Well, you didn't negotiate for because <laughs> you're fully stuck at, at our current pay scale. You should have said, oh, no, I didn't be by it. Uh, I'm very blessed and feel very fortunate, I think, with the support of the nursing department. And we have a nurse in every school. And I would just like to maintain it, sir. I think we're at a great level. And, and, and that's, that's the culture of, of our school system. You have an opportunity to probably get some extra personnel, take a little heat off of you, and you didn't do it. I want to thank you for that.
<laughs> you didn't do it. But that's, you see that throughout our system. Well, was it too many years ago we, our nurses were, we had some schools were sharing nurses. Yeah. So I think it is great that we do have yeah. a nurse at every school. Right. And then when a nurse is absent, we train uh, staff at the school to help assist with the law in uh, covering the medical needs. So and we do have several wonderful sons. It's, uh, I use the Marines motto, and adapt and overcome. I've seen a lot of that in this school system, and we, you guys are making it work, so thanks again for that. Well, you've just got the essay positions if you want to know that before we leave, too, so there's less emails going back and forth. When we initially started uh, with the essay positions, there were 17 positions, and over time, uh, the CTD firefighting position moved to CDT grant, and the behavioral specialist for general education also moved to another grant, so that lowered it to 15. But this year, we uh, needed a class size reduction at Bill's Gap, so we added one layer just for this year, so it's moved it to 16 positions. Now, Nine of those uh, positions are uh, elementary math, elementary middle school math and adventures, and uh, two are high school math teachers, uh, two are high school graduation coaches, and then of course the attendance person that works with Broadway in Alabama, uh, supervisor, and so on. So we, I mean, where we hired 100 teachers this year, uh, we, we think we'll be able to fill the teaching positions. Uh, um, well, thank you for that information. Thank you. Yeah, I'm good with that. But I just want to talk about graduation coaches, and this is from my knowledge. Uh, we have one at each high school. Are they certificated or not? No, they're not. And what, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm picking on any one person, but I'm just trying to get a better understanding of what the graduation coaches do and what's our cost. Because here again, we started this meeting out about talking about good financial stability and money management. And if we don't ask the questions moving along, it's just a question. I don't, want to, I don't want anybody to jump and get mad or upset or, or misunderstand a simple question as we go through this budget process. Because without this discussion, we're not moving the boat downstream or <coughs> upstream. Does that make sense? So, if we're talking about graduation coaches. What are, what are they costing us? And what exactly are we seeing them do in our schools? As far as cost, I'll have to get that to you when, when we, because those are two positions we're estimated to, we're recommending to keep. Yes. Um, based on our survey of staff. Um, and uh, we don't leave it tonight. It's, So they're making approximately fifty-seven thousand dollars a year, non-certified. Non so the job description does does list teacher license preferred. It's not mandatory because they're not instructing. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, what a graduation coach does is it it um, they meet with students coming into high school and help put them on the best track for success, and they monitor that across the board. So. Counselors do that for every single student, 
The difference for a grad coach is they're also a liaison between CTE and the high school and colleges, universities, and the high school, and anything in between, whether it be military, uh, whatever the case is. And also, focus, they also focus on any specified at-risk students. So those that are at risk of dropping out, those that are dealing with homelessness or other concerns coming in from the home, um, they work hand in hand with the counseling team and or the teacher, and in some cases, in most cases, both, to make sure that uh, intervention strategies are implemented across the board based on any of those needs. They, uh, as I've said, collaborate with the school counselors and uh, develop a plan of post-secondary success. So whether that's a track to career, TCAT, uh, uh, internship, or college, university, depending on the student. So they see the whole, they're in charge of basically the long-term plan post high school. Counselors are in charge of scheduling and providing for support for every student uh, year to year, and they, they cohort those students up typically. Grad coaches uh, are seeing the long-term plan carry out past high school. Okay. One thing that Matt was talking about earlier with the TSEB and the additional bonuses we're doing for TSA, one of them is called um, Outcomes Growth, and then, and so, or Outcomes Funding. So basically what that does, it provides incentive bonuses for students' performance on academic targets. So those coaches are also trying to help those students meet those targets, and then the more that we have that meets targets, then the more um, outcome bonuses. I understand. Get. Okay. I've asked Thomas Rolden to your question, um, and he's got he's got that going. He's sick this evening, but uh, he did want to remind me that he's got a presentation to the board specifically on grad coaches and the data they're tracking and working with. Uh, one of the things, going back to what Melissa said, are the grad coaches will be shifting and have shifted this year to really working on checking as many boxes for these students' opportunities as possible as they go through high school. So. Have they been offered um, uh, positions or courses within CTE? And if so, is there, a, is there a possibility of a track for CTE based on their interest? Have they expressed an interest in going to a four-year university? If so, what are the options for them? And are we making sure that we're meeting all those prerequisite needs before they leave high school? Uh, again, a lot of crossover with what the counselors do, but the grad coaches are really focused on not only high school, but post high school, because we have to track that data, especially through CTE. When those students leave high school, are they placed in an industry, and how long are they residing in that industry, and, and, and what's their uh, longevity in that? So we have to track all of that stuff for CTE anyway. They, they assist with that process. TISA, uh, or the state, I should say, not TISA, but they requested or <laughs> mandated two sets of audits so far this year, both taking multiple days in a short timeline. Our grad coaches, our counselors, um, Laura Lee, Thomas, uh, all, and Rodney, really had to work hand in hand making sure that we had all those students coded correctly. The grad coaches are integral in making sure that those students are not only given those opportunities, but they're uh, appropriately placed, working with the counseling team and the teachers. Sounds like they wear a lot of hats. It's, it's a very wide and generalized job description. It's posted on our website, but I can send it to you all so you can read it over. It was a, a brainchild of, of Thomas and the high school admin several years ago, and I think it's been one of those positions that I, you know, had a hard time wrapping my mind around the difference between a counselor and a grad coach, but as we've experienced over the last three years, um, they've been integral in making sure that students have access to everything they need post high school for the best success. Wish list. You started to say up. You got a wish list? I'm sure there's a lot. Can't thank me for Hannah, Hannah had one. You want me to mention? Yes, that? please. Yes. 
Hannah uh, texted, and uh, this is tax season for her, so she apologized for not being able to be here. She's busy doing taxes. Um, I also want to say, before I forget, uh, Chris and I, and I know a lot of Sir Gordonsville staff are, are probably at the, the uh, visitation services for our student from, our, our kindergarten student from Sir Gordonsville. Chris and I had an opportunity to run up there earlier and uh, we wanted to try to catch the family but unfortunately missed them. We were able to sign the guest book and, and I posted a message on their website uh, this evening expressing our condolences and, and making sure they knew that uh, they had, a, they had uh, and have thousands of people praying for them. Uh, very difficult thing they're going for uh, through um, seeing a child's casket is nothing that you want to ever see. Uh, and you never want to have to deal with in operating a school system and providing uh, services to students. But uh, please continue to uh, pray for that family. Tough situation. Anyway, back to Hannah. She had uh, texted her earlier and mentioned that she has talked to staff and has been receiving very, very good information about the work of our high school deans of students. And uh, we also, just to remind the board, we did fund one at our targeted intervention school, uh, middle school RMS, and they have also made a dramatic increase in, in dealing with behaviors proactively, uh, starting to see some, some positive attendance gains there at RMS. High school uh, has, has done really, really well, both high schools with their deeds. Uh, we don't have one at Clinch due to size, but Cherokee and Volunteer both have one for the first time, and uh, teachers are, are reporting that they are seeing dramatic positive increases in uh, rapport with students, proactive approaches with students, and heading off a lot of bigger issues uh, with the addition of deans. She then went on to say that she would like to see us consider a dean of students for the middle school level. So long story, she's asking for Dean of Students at Middle School. Now let's see what those, those costs would be. Sure. We, we will cost all of, we'll cost out an incremental raise across our lowest positions, as mentioned earlier, and then uh, we'll also cost out a Dean of Students at the Middle School. Okay. All right, real quick. I have a project that I've been working on for a number of years. I'm going to make this as, as quick and clear as I can. I've had this thought of doing, an, a, I'm going to call it right now, a booster appreciation dinner, one at uh, Volunteer and one at Cherokee and possibly one at Clinch. Now this would involve showcasing our facilities, showcasing our students to the people that we go to the most, and that is our businesses that fund our extracurricular activities. Now, my goal would be to have culinary arts prepare a meal. Uh, we get other organizations from the schools to serve, provide entertainment. You know, the band have uh, an orchestra, a jazz band, what have you. And we send out invitations to our area businesses that have supported our school systems in many different forms for many years. But what I understand that the comptroller doesn't look on that favorably with the school system paying for that. Well, here's a way I would like for us to look at it. Culinary arts is a class, correct? They get a grade. Band, they get a grade. Why don't we earmark some funds to increase the funding for culinary arts and possibly the band in order for them to have the funds to put on a gala, let's call it. Well, we're going to find a way to do it, hopefully. And how can we do that? Because I'm telling you, I've talked to a lot of people that have 
donated to our school system, and, and they really do a good job in supporting us. But what can we do to show our appreciation and so showcase our students and let the public come in, let the businesses come in and see what our kids can do? We did something similar to this not long ago. It was on a very, very, very small scale. Invited some some folks from local industry to come to uh, volunteer. And culinary arts was having a class and they had cooked lunch that day. It was very productive. The uh, folks that attended from the industry, they were very impressed. It changed their perception of what went on inside Volunteer High School. Now if we can do this on a larger scale, the perception's only going to get better. So I know that it's problematic. Ray, I see you. I see you. I'm thinking things, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, and, and Melissa, I've worn Melissa out over this, but I would like to find a way, if it is possible, to put a line out and or, or fund these entities, since it is educational, and they would be getting graded on it, if we could maybe do something like that. Now this isn't for this upcoming budget. We're talking, I wish we could do it for this upcoming budget, but there's just no way, and I'm not gonna put pressures on you guys for that. But I think it would be a tremendous shock and awe for Hawkins County Schools to be able to go to some of these folks that's given us money and say, hey, we want to show our appreciation. We want you to come out and see what we're doing. We're not going to, we're not going to ask you for a donation. That might be a tip job. But the benefits that we're going to see from that, I think, are priceless. So that, that would be my, on my wish list. Chris? Yes. We've got a grant writer. She might be able to write a grant for that. That works for me. It really does. I mean, it's a possibility. You know, and, and here it is in a nutshell. I've had. I've been out and solicited funds for for specific groups at our in our schools, and, and these these folks are saying, you know, we don't mind to give. We really don't. We don't mind to give. We want to help all we can, and they do. And I always get what I ask for. But what do we do for them? How long has Hawkins County Schools been? Forty four years now. Forty five. Have we been, as, well, Hawkins County School has been in business for a long time, but how long has Walter and Cherokee been? Since 1990. Yeah. Okay, now let me finish with this. I know this is it's, it's a lot to take in, but if we can make this work, have you ever seen or heard of a, an alumni hall of fame here in Hawkins County? Have you heard of it in other schools? You have? Well, we don't have it here. At some point in time, I would like to tie into this with a committee put together, not of our staff, but from locals, from local alumni, put a committee together, let them handle it, and identify some of our more successful or even regular, I don't want to use that word, but our alumni that have shown, had a, a, enduring life or being successful in business or just being successful in life and let's start identifying the, those folks to show our current students you can get there from here you can get there from here now, and that's all I'll shut up because our next board uh, budget workshop is Tuesday, April 11th at 6 p.m. Anything, anybody else got any questions, comments, or concerns? Is that a, is that a work we don't? So with our new budget preparation schedules, we have to have the first draft to you all by April the 15th. So this is the Thursday prior to that. So. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, just this month, we've got um, a month to what you're saying, Chris, our, our Cherokee culinary and our CTE teams are going to be presenting and showcasing a lot of different things for our Chamber of Commerce. 
and it's going to be on the upper end of the county this year for the first time that many feet has been. So we are holding that chamber breakfast at 8 a.m. Uh, actually, yeah, it started at 8, Brandon, 8 o'clock up at McPheeters. Brandon had said to work very hard to put an agenda together. The whole area of uh, Cherokee is going to be highlighted there. And uh, it's going to be a good evening. A lot of exciting news and updates as far as uh, number of students placed in industry, uh, different certifications they're working on. Uh, where we stand and where we want to go with CT, a lot of things are going to be discussed that morning in front of a lot of uh, uh, very prominent uh, business people and uh, community members there on the 22nd. I just want to do it on a larger scale. Yep. That's same, same type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Let's see it and do it once a year. Gotcha. And just see if the contributions come in a little stronger, actually. We're good? Or journal.